Thank you so much for uh, welcoming me into your meeting. Uh, I do have a presentation, but uh, to be quite honest, it's more for me than it is for you guys, it's just so I can remember what to say. Uh, I, I can be forgiven though, because I've got a uh, talk about why buy gas guzzlers at the Knights of Columbus later on today. But anyway. <laughs> All right, so considering an EV or just have questions about an EV, uh, the first thing I'd like to start with is knowing your budget. Uh, the reason being is because a lot of people seem to think that EVs are just too expensive to purchase. They're, you know, and in a lot of cases that, that's true. Um, however, they do start at a surprisingly low number. <laughs> Next slide. So they can be as low as about $42,000. Now it's MSRP, obviously you gotta add taxes and fees. And, uh, but you'll notice that also there's a $9,000 total, uh, two, sorry, rebates totaling $9,000 um, after tax. So that's uh, 5,000 from federal, 4,000 for provincial. Now the provincial rebate is income dependent. So if you're less than $80,000 a year, you get the full 4,000 from the provincial government and pretty much everybody gets the 5,000 from the federal government. Uh, now it does actually depend on the vehicle that you're purchasing as well. Some vehicles are not eligible for that full amount, some are, uh, but yeah, that's something to consider anyway. So they're not terribly out of reach as far as pricing goes. So the good question though is how much electric car range do you actually need? And that's another uh, common misconception. A lot of people think they need to have hundreds and hundreds of kilometers of range. Um, the reason I asked the question is because in reality, not a lot of people are driving more than about, well, you can see the Stats Canada says 17 kilometers is the average daily commute. Um, now I'm not sure if that's entirely accurate. That is on Stats Canada, so I guess it must be, but my, my guess would have been more like 30 or 40, 50 kilometers. Um, so that's to and from work though. So their average daily commute to work uh, was basically 17 divided by two. Um, but the smallest range you can get in an EV right now is about 240 kilometers, and that's in a Nissan Leaf. Not necessarily a vehicle I recommend, but <laughs> it's, still, it's still a usable vehicle, right? And furthermore, if you wanted to save a bit more money, you could even look at pre-owned EVs. Um, so one of your members here has a vehicle uh, called an Ionic that has a range of 274 kilometers. Those are on the pre-owned market, fairly easy to find nowadays. So what about charging? Well, lots of different charging options. So at home, if you only have a wall outlet, you can still use an EV. And you'll notice with a wall outlet, you can expect to be able to use about 50 kilometers or less per day. Anything beyond that, you're gonna need to go to something called level two. So level two, you can see is 240 volts. There's a few different options in level two chargings. You can actually go with a 16 amp, 30 amp, 40 amp, even up to 50 amps. But anytime I have a customer that's asking me about, you know, what type of charger should I get for my home, et cetera, I always ask them how far they're driving every day. And again, most people, according to Stats Canada, don't even drive 50K a day. So level one or a wall outlet might be perfectly sufficient. Now you also notice there it says CCS level three, public DC fast charging, which is a pay per use service. And those are great for long trips. So if you're going on a, on a trip to Vernon or a trip to Kamloops, or maybe you're doing a cross country trip like my wife and I coming this summer. Well, DC fast charging on newer electric vehicles will get you from 10 to 80% in as little as 18 minutes. Now that's of course under absolutely ideal circumstances. Uh, but where can you fast charge? This right here is a screenshot from an app called PlugShare. Uh, PlugShare is a pretty common application for most people to use if they're using EVs. This kind of helps you find those quick charging stations. So another common misconception is there's just not a, lot, uh, not a lot of charging stations around. Well, as you can see, there's quite a few. And I don't know if you can see the gray ones kind of poking in behind all the orange spots there, but those gray ones, they were currently in use when I took that screenshot. No, I didn't take the screenshot at two o'clock in the morning. This was in the middle of the day. So as you can see, most of those charging stations are, are ready to use. You can just go and plug your car in and start charging. Now, fast charging 
varies, right? So I said 18 minutes, that's under ideal circumstances, of course. Now, a lot of EVs on the market today aren't gonna charge necessarily that fast, so you can expect more like half an hour, 45 minutes, that sort of thing. But if you've been in the car for three, four, or five hours, getting out for 45 minutes really isn't that big of a deal. All right, so what about maintenance? Very little required. Um, EVs don't have oil, they don't need oil changes. Their brakes last way longer. Uh, they don't have transmissions. They have a single reduction gearbox, which I won't get into it because it's complicated, but that's got some fluid in it, only needs to be changed every 60 or 70,000 kilometers. Um, to give you an idea, as far as brakes on my own EV, 100,000 kilometers, my brakes are still fine. Lots of life left. So should you wait? Should you wait to buy an electric car? Should you buy one today, tomorrow, whatever? In the future, we're gonna be looking at solid state batteries. Again, I'm not gonna get into too many details about that because it's complicated, but solid state batteries are gonna be able to charge faster. They're gonna be able to give you more range. They're actually safer. You've probably heard of engine fire or sorry, battery fires, etc. As far as uh, solid state battery goes, those are things that we don't need to worry about. They're still a few years down the road. But my question is why wait? Because the industry is always changing. If you're gonna have an EV that has a solid state battery, Maybe you're gonna wait for the next best thing. Right now, EVs are, are a great option for a lot of people. So, what about all the myths? Uh, the, <laughs> these are the things that I like to talk about on Facebook of all places. That's where everybody likes to have all their, uh, their complaints about electric vehicles and whatnot. So are EVs dirtier than gas cars? Nope. So, a big, big myth in the industry is that because EVs use lithium ion batteries and they have to be, you know, they got the mine of lithium and all that stuff. Yes, batteries are very dirty to produce, but over the life of the electric vehicle, it's gonna be a lot cleaner. So on, on the uh, left side, you can see that is a graph that basically shows uh, carbon emissions over the life of a gas vehicle. Well, life of a gas vehicle, that's in miles. So up to about 375,000 miles what is actually uh, being put into the air, what is actually being uh, produced as far as uh, CO2 emissions. On the right-hand side is an EV. Now, obviously, we don't have to worry about vehicle use. So the yellow bit there, that 74%, that's from just using the gas vehicle. With an electric vehicle, you don't have to worry about producing anything when you're driving. So when you look at the efficiency of a gas car versus an electric car, electric cars are about 90 plus percent efficient at converting energy into motion. Whereas a gasoline vehicle is only about 30 to 40% efficient. And that's essentially why they're much dirtier over time. And it takes on average somewhere between about three to six years for the electric vehicle to become cleaner than its gasoline counterpart. And here you can so see, so that, uh, that graph was actually put out by the US Department of Energy last year. Um, this, what it's looking at here is they're showing the different cycles of gasoline use. So that's something a lot of, uh, a lot of other studies haven't really done is looked at you know, from, the, um, from where the fuel is sourced all the way to the, you know, being used in the vehicle, the vehicle being recycled, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of these studies that you see online where they're saying the gasoline cars are cleaner are actually just false because of the fact that they're not looking at the entire life cycle of not just the vehicle, but the fuel for the vehicle. So imagine taking that, that oil from the ground. If you've ever seen pictures of the, uh, the tar sands in Northern Alberta, you know what I'm talking about. It's a very, very dirty process. You gotta get that oil, you gotta refine it. So where does it get refined? Well, most of our oil actually gets refined overseas. So imagine all the carbon emissions it takes to get that unrefined bitumen to the ship, to the overseas, right? And then back again when it's been refined, and finally put into trucks, delivered to gas stations. The gas stations even need electricity to run. So <laughs> you have all of those different cycles, all of those little bits of the life cycle of fuel to take into consideration as well. All right, myth number two, batteries are expensive. Is that true or false? True. But with a caveat, you're not gonna need to replace your battery. So that's one of the biggest myths in the industry. Enter the Geotab EV battery analysis. So this right here, what we're looking at is over a process of about seven years, the average degradation of a battery 
for about 6,000 vehicles tested. So if you're wondering about this study, it's uh, on the GeoTab website, it's geotab.com. And basically they looked at over 6,000 EVs over their life cycles to see what sort of degradation those vehicles can expect. And this is not just in North America, this is worldwide. Um, and keep in mind, this is in hot climates as well. So the number one killer of batteries is heat. Not necessarily life or use, it's mainly heat. There's also some, you know, some other things as well, but mainly heat. So if you're further south, more likely you're gonna see some degradation. But even over the course of seven years, it's lost maybe 10%. So do you need to replace the battery after 10% degradation? No, it just means you have a little tiny bit less range, right? So that's another big misconception. And that's why I always bring this up when I'm, when I'm talking to people about EVs, because a lot of people think, oh, what I'm gonna do in 10 years, we're gonna spend 20, $30,000 on a battery. Well, you're not gonna have to. The battery will generally outlive the car. Now, I'm sure you've all heard on the news, whatever, people having to buy new batteries for their Teslas and whatnot. It does happen, but it's extremely rare. And usually the reason people are replacing their batteries is because they've been fast charged repeatedly for a very long time or they've just had a, the car for a long time. There are vehicles, there are EVs that have had three, 400,000 miles on them before they required a new battery. And at that point, if you do get a new battery, well, then you basically have nearly a new car again. Because that's the other nice thing about EVs is that the electric motors don't really degrade much over time. Um, and there's not a lot of moving parts. There's about 10 times more moving parts in a gasoline vehicle than there is an electric vehicle. I'm gonna pause here for just a moment because we've gone over a few things. Does anybody have any questions so far that I can answer? Yes, sir. Uh, some of the other costs uh, to have a stage two or phase two uh, charger is, oh, sorry. A uh, couple of questions. Um, one about the other costs, um, what it would cost to have a phase two uh, charger put in your home. And um, how much does it cost for that electricity on your electrical bill? Uh, also, when you do go to a fast charging station that's pay as you go, what are the costs involved there? All right, excellent question. So for a level two charger to be installed in your home, I can't really give you an idea, or I can't give you an answer on the cost because it's gonna depend on the house. Uh, but I can tell you this, I personally always recommend a level two 16 amp charger. Um, and we're actually gonna get to a, a, a bit about that in a moment. But the reason I recommend that low speed charger is because A, the charger is cheaper, B, it's better for your car, for your battery, C, it's, it's easier to install as well because you don't need to have you know, high, high voltage or high wattage wiring, high wattage outlets, that sort of thing. So you can get a level two 16 amp charger on Amazon for about 250 bucks. But then you do need a 240 volt power outlet. So getting that installed depends on the home, right? So I think you can expect at the very at the, 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 the lower end, you could probably expect about $250 to get that set up. On the higher end, it could potentially be into the thousands, uh, depending on how far away the breaker box is from the vehicle. Yes? I think uh, there are still provincial uh, grants for installing them, no? Absolutely, yeah. So BC Hydro actually does also offer a grant for installation of uh, EV charging stations. Uh, the only thing I caution you on there, though, is that the cost to do that is often more than just buying the $250 charger. So just keep that in mind. Yes, sir, in the back. Sorry, sorry, the other oh. five answers of the- uh, Sorry, one sec. Charger, cost yes, of cost of charging, charging yeah. The fast charging. Right, so cost of charging, uh, it's about $50 if you drive 100 kilometers a day. So $50 per month. So, and I, and I know that amount just because when I was commuting to and from Abbotsford every day, it was, it was 100 kilometers there and back. And I was doing that 22 days a week, of course, or a month, sorry, 22 days a week, uh, 22 days a month, because um, that's your typical work month, plus all the other driving you do in between. So for that sort of amount, about um, it's about 28,000 kilometers per year, it costs us about $50 a month on BC Hydro. And the fast charger. And the fast charger, yeah. So fast chargers, they're kind of funny because, uh, yeah, one sec. Um, fast chargers are often free still. So there are still quite a few. So a lot of those, uh, the points that you saw on the map were just free charging stations. A little bit slower ones generally, but still, you know, call it half an hour, 45 minutes. Um, so a lot of those are free. The ones that are not free vary in price as well. Some companies charge by the minute and some char companies charge by the kilowatt that you pull. 
Um, and as a matter of fact, the charging stations that we've been to over the course of having our vehicle, uh, the most expensive one I went to was about, if I remember correctly, it was about $18 for about 200 kilometers of charge. Now I say 200 kilometers of charge because that it it's going to depend on the vehicle, right? But yeah, about that. So it's it's very cheap. Yeah. Yes, sir, in the back. Can you go back to? Oh, I thank you from the bottom of my black heart. Uh, can you go back to the cost of finding the metals required in batteries? You know, there's the mining, the refining, the you know. Yeah. assembling it, all these things. You know, we, we should not forget there is a cost involved. There is also a climatic cost involved. You know, we can talk about gasoline and we are trying to handle it, you know, the exhaust, but you have the same thing when you go and look at pictures of what the refineries look like when they are refining the metal. It's not a pretty sight. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And that's why earlier when I had the, the screen up, actually I can just go back to it here. Um, so when you see the, the process of making the battery, um, so that 65% there, uh, sorry, the, uh, the, the blue line at the bottom, not 65%, the 18%, that's just construction of the battery. Um, so yes, that is a very dirty process. When you first buy your EV, it will have been much dirtier to produce that vehicle than a gasoline vehicle. Um, but over the course of its lifetime, it becomes cleaner fairly soon. So studies are showing, as I mentioned, about two to five or six years before they start to become cleaner. And that's just currently, or that's just based on uh, vehicles that were built. This was, this study was done in 2018, if I remember correctly, or 2019. This was done last year, but the study on how soon they became cleaner was 2018, I believe. Um, but yeah, so the, the better we get at making batteries and refining these materials and stuff like that, obviously the cleaner they'll get. I mean, gasoline has a much larger head start. Uh, gasoline cars have been produced for, you know, 100 plus years, whereas EVs, uh, well, amusingly enough, over 100 years ago, EVs were being produced more than gasoline vehicles. But in reality, the current sort of EV status or vehicles have only been produced for the last 10, 15 years. So it's getting much better. And when we start to get those solid state batteries and whatnot, you know, cleaner materials, and, uh, et cetera, as well. Yes? Do you have any information on um, uh, how much they're using recycled batteries now because they're not being fully degraded so they can actually use the material and not remind new material? You're beating me to it. So yes, there's, uh, there. <laughs> let's see if that's in here somewhere. Yeah, no. Re recycling used batteries is actually a great way for manufacturers to get their materials easier because it's actually significantly easier to mine recycled batteries than it is to mine fresh material. Um, on top of that, a lot of these batteries when they've completed their life cycle in vehicles are, in, are, are then used as uh, temporary energy storage. Um, but I'm going to get to that in a moment here. I don't want to get too much ahead of myself. Any other questions for the moment? Yes, sir. One more. Uh, what, uh, what's your take on hybrid vehicles? Uh, do you think they're a good deal combining sort of uh, both technologies? That's a good question. I, I, I like the idea behind hybrid giving you a very fuel efficient vehicle, but if it were me and I couldn't do the electric, I would go with a plug-in hybrid so that I at least had the option to daily commute on electricity and then on a longer drive, take the, you know, utilize the hybrid drivetrain. Uh, but a regular hybrid vehicle, you got to remember, regular hybrids and plug-in hybrids, you're not just pulling around, you know, one motor, you're pulling around two, right? You're, you're, you're bringing a battery as well as a gas engine, and one of them at any given time is just kind of along for the ride. So other than that, though, yeah, definitely a great option for anybody who's not ready to adopt full electric. Just a, another question. question, just regarding the mining of the uh, elements that are needed places like Congo and such mm -hmm. uh, has quite an impact on their society and also on their environment. Any comments on that? Yes, that's one of the arguments that we see the absolute most. Anyone who's ever purchased a cell phone or anything from China is no better off than anyone buying an EV. Because I mean, yeah, there's, there's an issue mining cobalt. Thankfully, most of these companies that are now, you know, producing electric cars, with the exception of, you know, maybe some of the lesser known Chinese brands, 
Um, but thankfully, most companies that we buy from in North America are now sourcing those materials ethically. Um, but when I look at, or when I get that, that argument, my response is, you know, you, your entire life, you've gone through, you know, purchasing all sorts of different stuff, not just, not just things with batteries, but all sorts of different things. And if we can, if we can purchase off the backs of lesser or, or not lesser, sorry, of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Thank you. If we can purchase things from off the backs of less fortunate countries and peoples, then I don't think EV should be persecuted because of you know that particular thing. And there's actually not much cobalt used in these batteries. It's very small amounts. It's obviously a lot more than you'll find in a cell phone, of course. But again, that is one thing that is improving for sure. Yeah. All right. Oh, did I get ahead of myself? I did. All right, so myth number three, I might run out of juice while I'm in a traffic jam. So this is a common, uh, common thing people are worried about, especially you know when we had the floods and whatnot, there was a couple of news articles about uh, one or two EVs that was stuck in the, in the traffic jams where they had the slides on two sides there uh, leading up to hope. Um, so that's false. <laughs> you can run out of electricity if you're in a traffic jam for a very long time. But the question is how long? So the typical EV battery is around 60 plus kilowatt hours now. So older vehicles had smaller batteries. But just to give you an idea, a 60 kilowatt hour battery can run your climate control for 60 hours, assuming it's fully charged, because climate control in a vehicle uses about one kilowatt. So you get stuck in a traffic jam for three, four hours, assuming your battery is not already almost depleted, it's really nothing to worry about. Funny thing is, though, a gasoline vehicle, a typical gasoline vehicle with a full tank can idle for about 20 to 40 hours. So I don't know about you guys, but I'd sooner be in the electric vehicle with a full battery if I got stuck in the winter blizzard or whatever than a gasoline vehicle, because I'll survive longer. My electrical box can't handle the load. So going back to the 16 amp charger. Uh, so electrical boxes in Canada anyway are generally 100 amp service or more. Um, and that's one of the things that again is false because if you get a 16 amp charger, 16 amps is really not much of a load on your 100 amp service. Probably. <laughs> so the reason I say probably is because some people's 100 amp panels are completely jam packed full of stuff. If you've got, you know, uh, a secondary suite in the home and you've got two stoves running and you've got a hot tub in the back, yeah, then maybe you're gonna overload your panel. But the nice thing is that most people will charge at night. So again, it's not generally something to worry about. Um, so 100 amp service can definitely handle 16 amps for a few hours at night. And again, how many kilometers are we actually using up on our vehicles every day? Well, we're not coming home with a dead battery generally, right? Myth number five, the power grid can't handle it. So not just the home's grid, but what about the power grid? Well, that's false too. According to BC Hydro, BC Hydro has been planning for increased adoption of EVs for years and will be able to meet the demand. So because the, you know, the EVs are, are ramping up slowly, the sales of EVs are ramping up very slowly, right? I mean, it's increased quite significantly over the last few years, but they're still going slowly enough that by the time it becomes a problem, it won't be a problem. BC Hydro and other electric companies are all over this. And again, if everyone was charging at 16 amps at night, this really wouldn't be a problem. A lot of our energy is actually sold to America. About 30% of BC Hydro's production is sold to the States. If we need it, we'll just keep it. They lose half the range in cold weather. It's another great myth and it's true. <laughs> so it's not a myth. Um, but. It's actually false. <laughs> Why it's actually false is because in extreme cold, temperatures below minus 30, yeah, sure, they might lose half their range. Well, we don't live in a place where it's typically minus 30 out. Uh, in our climate, you can expect to lose between 10 to 30% in the winter. Um, however, range loss can be mitigated by pre-warming. EVs are really, really great at doing one thing that gas cars 100% cannot do. Who's ever ran their uh, gasoline car in their garage with the, with the door closed? I did once. <laughs> and you survived. <laughs> 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 
I love this about my electric vehicle. I don't know about you guys, but my garage is not, wor not very warm in the winter. But I can run my EV in the garage for two hours, three hours, whatever I need to do. Well, I don't need to run it that long, obviously. But if I forget to turn it off or if I forget to, uh, you know, it'll actually start itself. That's the crazy thing. So you can actually set up in your vehicle to have it pre-warm at a certain time every, uh, every morning so that it's ready to go. And it's not just the cabin that you're warming, it's the battery that you're warming. So one of the biggest range killers for EVs is cold. Batteries are much less efficient in the cold. So if you can warm that battery up before you go, all the better. So you can really, really mitigate that 10 to 30% range loss in most EVs. There are a couple EVs, <coughs> Nissan Leaf, that can't do that, okay? The Nissan Leaf, yeah. That's pretty much the only one. Uh, okay, I'm gonna pause here for a second. Any questions? Yes, sir. So, when I built my house, I just finished the couple by last year, I put in a chart, I put in a 60 amp or whatever, 80 amp, I think 60 amp, plug in my garage for an electric vehicle. Nice. Because I've always wanted an electric vehicle, but I won't buy one because I don't like free stuff from the government. <laughs> <laughs> they're, 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 that's not free electricity. I believe it's not free electricity, so I don't think that it's proper to use because if somebody's paying for it, and it's not the consumer. So I don't like that part of free chargers. But however, my question is, what vehicle would you buy if you were to buy an electric vehicle? Me personally? Yeah, but what, what would be a good electric vehicle? Like who's, who's, who's leaving the charge on You're asking a car salesman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do want to buy one, I'm just waiting for them to start charging. So for the, okay. I've been asked not to sell my product. So the only thing I'm going to say is that for the last two years in a row, one brand has won North or sorry, World Car of the Year, World EV of the Year, and World Vehicle Design Award of the Year. Two years in a row, it's never been done in history. And that was Hyundai with the Ionic 5 and the Ionic 6. So if you're asking me which one I would recommend, it would be one of those two. Unfortunately, they're really hard to get. Um, there are a few companies that you know, well, there's a lot of companies that make really, really good products right now. Um, I have no problem with companies like Tesla. Um, you know, the, the Mustang Mach-E is a reasonably good car. Um, there, there, are, there are certain things that you need to know about certain vehicles. Like I bring up the Nissan Leaf a couple times already. Um, but what you're going to want to do is if you're looking in the EV market, find something with a heat pump. It's very, very important in Canada because we do have colder temperatures than down in the States where they don't really need heat pumps. Uh, so heat pump really, really reduces the amount of range loss due to climate control being on and whatnot. And you're going to want to find something that's capable of pre-warming and cooling the battery actively. So whether you're looking new or used, that's, a, that's another important thing to look for. Uh, and then as far as the efficiency of the vehicle, that might be a point uh, uh, important to you as well. So some vehicles are significantly more efficient than others. Um, the, the vehicle that Deborah has, for instance, is an incredibly efficient vehicle. Uh, you compare that to a Hummer EV, it uses about one-fourth uh, one the amount of power as a Hummer EV. So efficiency might be important to you. But yeah, those are the things I would mainly look out for, is the heat pump uh, and the, the battery temperature management system. And are they getting cheaper as they become more prolific? Absolutely, yeah. So the, uh, the, the Nissan Leaf starting at $42,000, the reason I use that one as an example is because it's literally the cheapest one you can get right now. Uh, the Chevy Bolt EV uh, also got very cheap, but it now has been discontinued. So, Edward, I'm sorry, but we only have about a minute left. Oh, so I'm going to ask you to finish your presentation and then perhaps if you've got time for questions at the end. Okay, sounds good. We'll get back to that. <laughs> okay, batteries can't be recycled. False. <laughs> so used batteries are often reused. Uh, so in temporary energy storage. They are easier to mine for materials than traditional mining practices. Not sure what happened to my slide there, that looks weird. Uh, used batteries don't need to be very good to be useful. So if you have an EV battery that's lost 50% of its range, which is extremely unlikely, but if it were, if that battery doesn't need to move anywhere, if you're not carrying it around in a car, then it's still a lot of energy storage for, you know, what have you. Uh, temporary sto solar storage or wind farm solar storage, something, something like that. 
Uh, new, new battery recycling plants are being built all the time. So there's there was literally just a new one completed in Canada in Burnaby, I think. All right, that's it. <laughs> Questions? <laughs>